Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Stardom Road podcast. One week later than usual, but we made sure to come back with a great back to back of a series for everyone. It's pretty timely, of course. Um, you know, Utami Hayashishta's World of Stardom title reign, of course, the new ace of Rossi Ogawa's promotion that, of course, has been announced now. Um, but with me, is as always my co-host Trent. Trent, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. It's a it's an interesting time to be a Joshi fan and a Stardom fan as well. But I think we, you know, let's expand it to the broader universe now. A Joshi fan, interesting times, and especially as a Utami fan, uh, very interesting times as well. And it's exciting to finally kick off title reign episodes because this is something we've talked about a bit like when we were discussing stardom road and what we wanted to do with it title reigns came up it's an easy kind of topic to look at and pick but we've taken our time on this we didn't want to pull the trigger too early and i think this is a really interesting title reign to start with um not just because of the timeliness of the world because yeah this is not a timely show typically you could be listening to this in 2025 or 3025 for all i know um Hello to the 3,000 fans, by the way. Uh, but uh, it's an interesting time if you are following this to week to week to see where we're at and where this title reign kind of ties into it all. It's one of the most important, one of the best stardom, uh, World of Stardom title reigns in history. So it, it's a very fitting start for us. Uh, we do like to take you know, advantage of timing and whatnot, mm. but... Um, I'm very excited, obviously, of Utami's future, but Utami doesn't get to where she is without this World of Storm title reign. This World of Storm title reign obviously came at a very important time in the company, of course, then run by Rossi Ogawa, coming out of a tough age in the world of pro wrestling, not just stardom, but stardom obviously going through so much in the year 2020. Uh, we've talked it. We've talked about it many, many times on the show already. Uh, not only is it COVID, which, you know, changes everything and all of this title reign is with just clapping crowds. And, uh, but this is also the time where stars needed to be made. You know, we mm. no longer had the Kigetsu, Suzuki's, uh, Ariso Shiki's or Hana Kimura's to lean on. Of course, uh, you can always trend out. You Trent out. You can always check out Trent's article about like Trent what, all the time. what could have been regarding that big four and what you know the future held. But the 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 fact is, Utami was always being positioned to be at the top mm. of stardom. And while it maybe came a little bit earlier, as we will talk about throughout this entire episode and ne the next episode, she got better and better and better along the way. Well, it's interesting, too, because we talk about, oh, this came very early in her career. Like, for context, for people who need to sort of piece everything together, this essentially happens at the start of her third year in professional wrestling. So to put that in 2024 terms, she's still el eligible for the future of Stardom Championship right now, if this is 2024. And here she is being put into a position to lead the company when they perhaps more than ever need someone to stand up and go above and beyond because they're dealing with mm -hmm. COVID pandemic crowds. And yes, because of the way things were structured, they didn't have to draw as many people to each show because of the spacing. Right. But you also have to keep in mind, people weren't wanting to leave the house at the end of 2020 and the start of 2021, especially in Japan. Like there's mm -hmm. that hesitancy to going because if you catch COVID, you're locked up for a couple of weeks and you get sick and it's still kind of the, the, the vaccinations aren't really there for everyone and all of that. So finding a way to get people interested enough in professional wrestling to go out and essentially risk themselves to see these right. shows, putting it on the shoulders of someone who's only been wrestling for three years, that's a tall order. Yeah, it is a tall order, but... There is no wrestler set up for this more than Utami. You know, she was given a lot time and time again from the very first day she wrestled. Check out ever. our Super Rookie like, episode. Yeah. Yes, check out the Super Rookie. If, if you could tell, we're big fans of Utami. Um, and, you know, I think when it comes to how important this reign would become, none of us could have imagined that 
You know, none of us could have imagined. We knew, you know, if you were a fan of Stardom, you knew it was going to be important because obviously mm. this is going to be their new star. This is their new attempt. But by the time we get to the halfway point of her title reign, Stardom explodes in popularity, and she is a big reason why. Uh, but I'm very excited to talk about this. Going back and watching the matches for this first set obviously was lovely because you just see her get better and better and better. And you su- you go from watching her wrestle someone else's match to start running the match and controlling the match. Mm. And, and ultimately, a lot of this first half of the reign is proving that she should be the one in the main events. She should be the ones getting all the attention. And of course, we'll end it with an emphatic fashion at the end of this episode. But should we get right into it? That sounds like a plan. So, of course, Tommy Hayashishta won the five-star Grand Prix in 2020, defeating Hameka in the finals to do just that. She would go on to challenge Mayu Iwatani, who, of course, was holding it down uh, for stardom in the time and another very important reign that we will talk about somewhere down the line. But this was November 15, 2020 at Sendai Cinderella. You want to talk about a tough crowd. You know, if you've ever watched any Sendai Pit show, you know how cra- how tough this crowd is. It really very is in pits. Yeah, it's very fitting that she lost her tag belts, uh, her final belts in stardom in the Sendai Pit. I was just thinking about that when I was watching this match. And her and Mayu, you know, they're going out there, and obviously they have had such better matches post mm. this. Um, and I still think this is a very good match. It's not out of this world, Mayu. It's not out of this world, Utami. But it's a good enough match to say, this is our champion now, right? This is the champion we are going with. And, you know, it got one of those reactions when she won the title in the end that, you know, made people make noise in in a time that they couldn't. So I think that's very important about the match, too. They set it up very well. And Mayu, you know, Mayu went all out to make Utami look like a world mm. champion by the end mm. of this match it was a great combination of my quite dominant in this match mm-hmm. which is unusual for her in a lot of title situations because typically even if she is the champion she's playing a little bit of the underdog role but she's here to make utami play that underdog role and grow into the championship position literally as she gets the pinfall It's Look, yeah, they have had better matches, and Utami obviously will go on to be a far better wrestler. But I think this was a very important match because it did tell people that Utami is a main event level wrestler at this point because to this point, she was still a little inconsistent. She'd have great matches. Like, you can look at the start of the year, her match with Arisa Hashiki um, for the Wonder of Stardom Championship. That was a fantastic match. But she's still not necessarily someone you can just chuck in there and go, well, you're going to get a great match. You're going to get a main event caliber match out of this person. So getting this first match off on the right foot and obviously going up against someone like Mai who can carry the match a little bit and lead the match as an experienced veteran is very important. But Utami comes out of this, I think, looking really, really good. And looking back at this now, I think I appreciate what happened more than I did at the time. I was Mm -hmm. still a little bit emotionally invested in the Maya reign. And given where Stardom was at, I kind of wanted her to remain champion. So I was a little bit like, oh, okay, this is... I didn't think Utami was quite ready, to be honest. Um, but this match does go a long way in saying, look, there's a reason to believe. Trust us yeah. on this. Rossi literally on the microphone saying, trust us on this. Maybe I should have trusted him a bit more. This was a fantastic match. And it really does get the title reign off on the right foot. It does. It's a very strong effort. They put a lot, you know, you get a lot of big moves. You get Mayu going all out. She hits the tombstone on the apron. She follows that up with a dive. Um, I wrote in my notes, uh, (laughs) the Sendai could crowd his ass. (laughs) Because I was just like, they're going all, I'm like, I understand, like, it's a clap crowd, so you can only do so much. But they weren't even clapping for these things. And I was like, what are you doing? (laughs) It really feels silent at times. And not in the respectful Japanese crowd silent no. just in the almost like they don't know what yeah. to do and this is still early enough in the the COVID clap crowd era that you can understand especially in Sendai rather than Tokyo maybe the crowd's not fully sure how to get into it 
in that situation. Yeah. The match deserved a better crowd. I do mm. think if this was put in front of a normal crowd, it would have felt be like a just bigger by deal. Mm-hmm. This is and this is something we'll talk about a lot during this topic with her reign. She has to do all of this in front of a club crowd as an unproven, somewhat champion. Yeah, Oof, like yeah, just seeing everything she was up against, what she managed to accomplish was fantastic. Yeah, um, yeah. this is kind of proof of it. This match deserved a high. Hyped crowd. Mm-hmm. It didn't get it because of the clap crowd. Maybe didn't get it because Sendai was thinking about right. eating food afterwards. I don't know. It, it's the first, you know, two matches of her reign, the win and the first defense where she's led. Mm-hmm. You know, she's led by her opponent. And it's after that we see her break out into her own match. Yeah. And that's where confidence is fully found. A lot of the time in these matches, when she. You know, this is something that I also noticed in like many of her rookie matches. She really likes to lean on the sleeper hold mm. to get her along in matches. And she did that here and it was like very telling. Like I remember her doing that in her rookie match. You yeah. know, it's like that is something and she still does it to this day. She did it in her Micah challenge, mm. you know, a month ago from this recording or less than a month ago now. But either way, like that is something she still leans on. But I remember back then it was like really slow down the pacing now she works it a lot better in so that was one thing i noticed in this match um she also hit their raid crash onto the apron as well which is another staple of her move set during this title reign um, yeah when you watch the matches back to back to back it's like ah here comes the air raid spot yes 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 uh some of them look a little nastier than others um we'll get to the b match but like (laughs) i knew you were talking about that one yeah 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 that was like oh oh (laughs) and i remember watching that at the time and i was like oh dear god is she okay um at that moment was when b decided she was retiring from yeah yeah my you hit my you hit a moonsault we got a big kick out for utami um, and then it led to the she went into the sleeper to get herself to towards the end of the match because I remember vividly watching Utami's title reign right from back then. And I said, She's so good already when she figures out how to fully close a match, mm. she's going to be the best in the world. Yeah, and when she, and I said to myself, Whenever she gets that next title reign, it's going to be incredible. Whoops. Uh, <laughs> Thankfully, there'll be somewhere else to do that, which I'm looking forward to. But uh, she'd hit a Lariat, Torture Act Bomb, and a BT Bomb for the win. By the way, when she was in the BT Bomb back then, that thing was nasty. I was like, you need to put more oomph on that like you did back then. I know she does the spin now. I don't like the spin. I like when she just absolutely slams. I mean, it helps that Mayu was the one taking it here. But, like, that was nasty she did it to mike to the next match uh um, i do think a shout out need to be put to my use we talked about how good she made her time look her like we talk about it, her selling was just next level on this match like it, it really defines the difference between someone who can put someone over and someone who can make that person look like an absolute mega star yeah and that's what my did you put just about anyone else in this role it doesn't work as well yeah it, it's it you know it's a Mayuism in many ways. Like many people say, Mayuisms were like when she messes up or something. But Mayuisms in her matches are really just making her opponent look like a million bucks. Mm. And when this match was over, when she hit that BT bomb, it was like okay, like this you know stardom. While I'm upset that Mayu had to lose this title match, they might be okay. And you know, moving forward in time, we learn that stardom's going to be okay with Utami mm. on top of the world. Obviously, um, it's pretty crazy to think all the way back at 2020, you know, all, you know, three and a half years ago now, this is the one title reign we get from her, yeah. the one singles title reign, and and after and you know this is kind of a topic maybe for more of the next episode but i'm going to talk about it now and how i think we all were waiting and waiting once that rain ended and waiting and waiting and waiting and here we are and just didn't happen but uh let's get to the next match because the next match is very important Mm. next match is one of the most important in the entire 
entire reign. I know everyone wants to talk about the Shuri matches, and we'll get there. But having a strong first defense is as important as anything, especially when you're going on a dominant 400-plus day reign. And they picked the perfect person for it. That, of course, being Momo Watanabe. And, you know, I was a little I was a little upset watching this match. I'm not going to lie. I was like, oh, well, where, where, where was this Momo? Like, you know, I like Oedo Tai Momo. I do. I think there's like, and when she turns, you know, when she turns it on, she's still great. Mm. But like Queen's Quest Killer Momo is just something else. And, you know, they still had a little bit of that aura when she stepped in the ring. And her and Utami facing off. And they wrestled momo's match mm-hmm. another key part of this early title reign and the match was great as a result this to me and look, i haven't gone and watched the second half of the matches that we're going to be talking about yeah. next week this is the second best this the second best match of the first half of the reign and probably the third best match overall in her reign not counting, and that's yeah, the Shuri matches are one and two, probably. Could even be better than the second Shuri match. I, I need to rewatch that one, but this is so good. Like, if people were unsure about Utami winning the title, I think this one really tells you, like, there is something here. Now, yes, she's working with arguably Stardom's best wrestler to put on a great match. Like, yeah, Momo around this time could wrestle a four and a half star match blindfolded. Um, but it, it's such a great put together match that made everyone look great it's so fascinating to see the perception of the utami title reign being before and after shuri when these first two matches and especially this first defense is as good as it is like it's almost Mm -hmm. like people forgot that this match closed out the year because it is such a banger yeah it's it's incredible match like and as i've watched back this rain i actually forget how much i just love it like i love there's only one well two matches we include include natsuko's but i don't really count that that's not really fair because that match was heating up and then things just you know happened but uh there's just one match from this entire rain like i don't necessarily need to go back and watch which Mm. is such a credit because it's in the first half and when we get to it and explain why it's like oh well that's not really The rest of them, it's just like, it's so great. It's just Mm -hmm. so great. And this match is what catapults that. You know, Momo being the dominant force and still having a little bit of that white uh, white belt rain aura to her in title matches, especially because she's someone that's chasing the world of stardom championship at this point, right? This is now her goal. Mm -hmm. This is her, this is her destination. And she watched someone in her own group win the title it's just such a great story to follow between these two um and the match is just hard hitting it is it is like you said it's a momo match and utami is able to play right to it um i think my appreciation for this match becomes even more when you see you know what they go through and how they set up the big kick out at the end Mm. which of course was the peach sunrise kick out um but like Momo was in, and this is a lot like the Mayu match in that Momo was in control for a lot of this match, and it's not. It's like the halfway point where it starts to become okay. This is Utami. It's time to overcome and get back into it and fight it off. But even so, when you get to that Peach Sunrise spot, you bite. You know, back then you just bit, and that's the beauty of that move. What I liked about this match, and you talk about the momentum being still Momo in the first half. What I did appreciate, though, is it's not immediately Momo. Right. In the Mayu match, Mayu kind of dominates the first three quarters quite handedly. Utami's kind of on top at the start. She's working Momo's mm. leg. She's grounding her. She's sort of running her game. And then I love these kind of stories where the younger wrestler just makes one little mistake, leaves the door open just a little bit, and the veteran in Momo Watanabe takes advantage, hits a big move, completely changes the trajectory of the match. Yeah. So what you're seeing is someone who is getting better, learning from their uh, learning and growing, but they're still not quite there yet. They need these matches against my, they need these matches against Momo to become the best version of themselves as champion. It's a growth experiment. And I think Momo does so well in playing that role. And mm-hmm. Itami does so well in playing to that as well. And as these, as this rain goes on, 
you begin to see her as a more dominant champion as someone who is has earned that position, which she couldn't have done without these opening matches and having to come from underneath like she does. Yeah, yeah, it, it's perfectly built. And, you know, I, I do want to give credit to Momo for that because you do feel that Momo-esque match. But Utami plays to it perfectly. I think that is that Queen's Quest connection, why it works so well, um, and just their connection with one another. And, and the faction Uta- versus faction. Yes. And Utami's way of getting back into this match after the Peach Sunrise is hitting some nasty German suplexes. Mm. Um, and she hit a another amazing BT bomb to win here. And I was just like, I'm, again, I'm just sitting there I'm like, why is this? What? What happened? <laughs> I was like, she learned that the spinning one allows yeah. you do to do the the grab the rope spot to survive. Yeah, yeah that, I think that's great. the main thing is it allows that ironically control of the match. But man, it's just so nasty. It was like, mm. and Momo ate this one. Like yeah. when I, when I watched Momo take it, I was like, yeah, you know, no one's kicking out of that. <laughs> I was like, nor should they. Um, it's just a fantastic match that I uh, I ask if you've never if you only have seen the Shuri matches from Utami's reign, this is the first one to go back and go out of your way to check out. Unless you're doing a chronological watch, though. But yeah, if you're just picking, well, you should watch things. all of them truthfully, just because yeah. you watch the growth of Utami. You should watch but, all of them because that's what we're doing. Let's walk the road yeah. with them. Don't take the yeah. highway. But if you are so, if you are a new fan, and You've only heard of the Shuri matches. There's a lot more greatness in this ring. Yeah, yeah. And this is a big one. And this is this is the first big feather in the cap for Tommy, I think, as a main event star. Truth, mm-hmm. like top yeah. tier, bona fide top star. Like this is the first. All right, she might have it. You know, it's yeah. like okay. And then, and then they really challenge her the next two reigns, and this is where she has to now be the one running it. Mm-hmm. And I think you see that challenge here. The next match, of course, is against Micah at the 10th anniversary show. Micah, very green. Very green at this time. I think been Mike, wrestling for, what, a year and a half, maybe? Yeah. Uta- Utami and Micah have many great matches to them. Mm. This is the first big one, and you mm. see signs of greatness in it. Yes. But it's not the full-on match. And again, they wrestled for 24 minutes. These two should not have been wrestling 24 minutes at that time. Um, But there's still a lot to take from this match because then they go later in this reign Mm. and they deliver a great match. It was a way to build to that. And again, you see greatness come out and you start and this is your first time seeing what does the utami title match truly look like Hmm. and it kicks more into gear the next few matches obviously but i do think that this was very important in obviously the growth of their rivalry but also the importance of utami finding herself because this is you know after this she Loses that main spot for a while, which we will be talking about. Uh, that is a big topic point from here on out. But uh, what were your thoughts on this match? Also, is this the last world title match in a it is. It's the last time the red belt yes. was defended at Kirk and Hall, which is a very fun little factoid. Um, I don't think we'll ever, as long as Stardom keep running the white out, I don't see them sort of d- defeating that claim. Um, it's no. a fine match. It's definitely not indicative of what you get from Mike and Utami later on in their careers and even later on in the year. But it is nice that we can, when doing this retrospective, we get these two matches at either side of the Utami reign to see how far they come. Because yes, Micah is incredibly green. Utami is still pretty green, especially in this kind of leadership role in the match. Like, you're chucking her into the fire here, expecting them to run a 25-minute match at a main event sort of situation for a world title when together they're as inexperienced as most world champions even come close to. You know, the right. Rock didn't win till like seven years into his career. That's less than the combined experience of these two right here. Yeah, They do a good job considering. 
but it definitely feels like what was asked of them was just a little bit too much. The match drags in points. You can tell they don't quite have the smoothness down pat going from spot to spot, transitioning through the stuff. It's not a bad match. No. But you you would expect more from a world title match, and you would expect more if you're in 2024 going, oh, wait, Utami and Micah had a world championship match in January of 2021? Hell, yeah. Just temper your expectations a little bit. They they legitimately get better if you just watch their three World of Stardom title matches. They legitimately get better each time, uh, yeah. which is at, what you want to see. And I think there are some moments in this where I'm like, yeah, but it's so slow at points where it's just mm. like, if this is your worst match of your title reign, considering the experience level, and that's mm. pretty much the main reason, it's a special title reign, folks. And that's essentially yeah. how I feel about this match. Still good. Mm. Just doesn't get to the level that I feel like every match besides the Torah match, obvious reasons, gets yeah. to. It um, is also funny, speaking of Torah, watching this match, I, I was watching and I'm going, where's where's the blue markings coming from? Are they getting bruised? And then I'm like, oh, I remember the match that was before. Julia How could you forget? Torah. How the, could the you forget the Julia of Tiles? In that match, yeah. It just took me a little while to remember. But it was like, ah, yeah. I, I love to bring up the uh, Julia tiles. They are mm-hmm. etched in my brain forever. I hope she brings those. Death match Julia when the tiles come out. Yeah, Ho- I hope WWE gets to see those tiles when that happens. Now they're, they're a cinder block company. That's true. That's true. Well, I wish I wish Julia was a cinder block wrestler. <laughs> those damn tiles. All right, um, but let's get to now a humongous match for her. Mm. Because this is a gigantic match in the history of stardom. It is All Star Dream Cinderella in the Nippon Budokan, one of the biggest shows in company history. Over three thousand people in attendance. So, despite the clap crowds, despite the uh, restrictions, they ran one of the biggest venues in Japan, and they put on a humongous show. However, and I remember. So, go to go back to the Micah match. I remember the worldwide reaction to what happened because everyone knows the next title match is going to probably happen at all-star dream Cinderella. Mm. That is the big yeah. show. And I was like, all right, who's going to be the big world title match. And out comes Saya Kamatani. And at that time, folks, Oh boy, Oh boy, Oh boy. Did people not have trust in old Saya Kamatani. Mm. And that that year, the, the, I would love to do an episode just on Saya Kamatani's 2021 because they gave her so many big matches and everyone was like, oh, I don't know. And then she hit a home run every single time. Um, but this was for the biggest match. However, they would not be in the main event as the Wonder of Storm title match, hair versus hair between Tam and Julia would take center stage. And this would become a trend for Tommy. And we'll get to that after this match. We'll talk about how Tommy's frustrations started to uh, bubble up a bit. I I remember there there were articles by like actual like websites of like you know stardom receiving criticism over you know not putting Julie put not putting Tommy in the main events. And I remember writing an article myself about like all right. Let's let's get the world champion man. That damn it! Um, it didn't help that the person in the main events was Julia, who people kind of looked at as being could not stand. the Utami from a year or two prior, getting pushed above her quote unquote means. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's get to the Saya match. Lots of doubts, hmm. and fair this. enough because very Saya fair. was unproven. At this Saya, point, was, Saya not was not at that level yet. No. And Utami Tyler. coming off the Micah match, which was a yep. little disappointing. Yeah, mm-hmm. She wouldn't have someone leading her in this spot. Mm-hmm. I think the concern was justified. It like, was. I want to specify this. I was, it was concerned. I was questioning it. But I think even in hindsight, that is justified to come into it being... Oh, a- absolutely. I do want to put that out there. It was absolutely justified. The concerns were justified. However, after this match... Concerns went away with the Tommy for good. Saya, they still remain because you know one great match is need a little more. Because we but, saw it, like Utami had the one or two great matches being mm-hmm. led, and Saya was quite unquote being led here. But and Utami got her chance to put a match 
of hers, and they didn't go too long. They went 15 mm. minutes and 46 seconds. Uh, Sai Kamatani did the Tope Con Hilo, which she does not do at all anymore. Mm. I rem- because I remember she's she's done this move twice, and I think they've both been to Otami. She refuses to do the Tope to anyone else. For anyone that's wondering, it's the Terminator dive that Kenny Omega does if you need a better Without the do, 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 do. Yeah, she did not do that. But she just runs into it and like my jaw drops because you know mm. all, she always does the cross body now. Like that's her yeah. that's her comfort one. But she hit it so picture perfect. And they went out there to prove a point. That's what they did. That's what these two did. And 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 by the end, Saya, you know, went from eh, well, to oh, okay, mm. she might she might Okay, she may have it. And Utami went from okay, that Mike and Mash was kind of a let down. Maybe, maybe she can't run a match to oh, we're off to the races now, folks. Yeah. We're off to the races now. Uh just a fantastic match. They hit all the big moves that you were not gonna see in the main event, right? Tam and Julia were gonna have this very personal battle, the hair versus hair, slap each other across the face type thing. You didn't These see Tam went- going for the Phoenix Splash. No, no, no. We, we these had the big moves. They had a Canadian destroyer in this match. A well set up one too, which popped me good, by the mm. way, because I completely forgot about that when rewatching this. And I was like, and I love the, I love the commentary team yelling Canadian destroyer. Yeah. I was like, that's great. Um, you know, you get the Star Crusher, which obviously at the time, Saya's big move was the Star Crusher. Mm. Uh, you get the Phoenix Splash and. Boy, oh boy, just based off of things that have happened since then with that move, not just Saya. Watching someone crash and burn is always a terrifying thing because she yeah. isn't rolling through. No, no. This she is, is eating it. Yeah. She's absolutely eating it. Um, the BT bomb reversal. Let's talk about the BT bomb reversal, shall we? It is one of the great near falls mm. because I remember watching this match live. Mm. This is the first stardom show I ever watched live. Um, and I remember watching that, and I thought Saya Kamatani had won the world title. That's how great of a near fall it was. It was like, you could argue it was three, truthfully. <laughs> it was so good. And the crowd roared. And you know why? Because they built it up as a match-ending move from Saya Kamatani prior Bingo. to the show. It's it's one of the things I remember most distinctly about the feud is they wrestled a couple of times prior. Sai Kamatani won matches with the Frankensteiner pin. Mm-hmm. And she gets Utami with that same move. I think it might have been at Kurokan. Yes, it was, it was. Uh, at the very least. Uh, yeah, it was. And it's it a like preview a, tag. Yeah, and she gets her with that move. Mm-hmm. They built it up as a move that Sai Kamatani can hit out of nowhere. She hits it on the finisher. Pitch perfect. And yeah, the crowd bought into it. Like again, this is a clap crowd. They cannot be loud. They're not meant to be doing what they're doing. And this no. is in the Nippon Budokan with three and a half thousand, which is a damn good draw from them. But that's still less than half of what the Budokan designed to hold. Right. The fact they get as loud as they did just speaks to how big a moment that was. And bravo for Stardom and the two girls for getting it to that point that it was a. Mm. <gasps> are we about to see the victory here? This match is like a booking brilliance, mm. truthfully. It's like everyone doubted it, reasonably so. Yeah. And in the build-up, there was nothing to blow you away to say, oh, this is this is going to mm. you know, knock your socks off type thing. And it was it was just fantastic, you know? Like these, these two absolute – you couldn't steal the show on this show because right. you went you went Mayu versus Yoshiko to this, to the main mm. event, yeah. which is just three incredible matches back to back to back. But damn it, damn it, they tried. And I think that was really a sign of who Tommy was becoming as she led a match mm. and as she led as world champion through this reign. And we also see a little bit of what we would come to know more of her in the sense that uh, in a few factors, but one in particular was how good she makes Sai Kamatani look in this match. Yes. Now, sitting here in 2024, we saw her give the pinfall to Sai Eater on her way out. So, yeah, she's someone who's a giving person, which is yeah. kind of crazy after the, the push that she got. But, like, she makes that young Sai Kamatani look like a legitimately, you know, that she could have been and deserving of the red belt. The the one in particular is off that star crush you mentioned. 
Utami doesn't kick out because, oh, she's stronger than the move. She kicks out because the move hits and she falls onto her stomach, which gives an extra three or four seconds that takes the Kamatani to roll her over and get the pin, mm. which is just enough to justify it not being a three count. Yeah, mm. you see that kind of thing. Oh, a finish has been kicked out of. It makes them look bad. It didn't make Saika Kamatani look weak or unable to win the match with the move. It made right. Utami look lucky. And there's a very yeah. big distinction there. Kamatani comes out of this not just because she put on a great match from a oh the five star you know ratings and you know was this technically proficient. She comes out of this looking like a proven main event caliber wrestler at her point already. Now obviously it takes a while for people to fully get behind that because this is just one match. She has to go on the Cinderella tournament, has to go on and have that match with Tam, but. This, you know, Utami went out of her way, despite still needing to prove herself yeah. somewhat as a champion, she went out of her way to make Kamatani look like a million bucks. Yeah, it was, it was perfectly executed, perfectly done, and a mm. reason that... A reason that we sit here, right, and, and we look back so fondly at this reign. Like, yeah, the Momo match was great. Big mm. whoop. Congratulations. You had a great match with Momo Watanabe during that time. It's this match that really I feel because it's this match and then the next one that's so much better than expectations that it's like mm. Utami's mate. Well, the match after that too for other reasons, but <laughs> we'll get there. Um, yeah. But it's like, oh, Utami is everything that she's supposed to be, and you're starting to feel that this match, the mm. next match, is so on. She just hits another groove, and it's after this fantastic match she had a bt bomb of course to win this one as well um and we start to get a little more of that twistiness on it that you know it wasn't as uh devastating anymore um but it's a finisher nonetheless and when she hit that move you knew it was over yeah. um the, the spin looked cool especially early on like it is kind oh, of yeah. cool yeah I, I, nowadays i kind of wish she just did like the the prop up and slam yeah. but like, i appreciate the the visual of the she's spinning she's spinning she's spinning yeah yeah i, I think she should spin then just stop and then <sighs> see to me that just defeats the point of the spinning like you either spin and throw into the well, spin I just wouldn't do just... spin at all. To be fair, yeah, I would. Just but it was kind of like it, it reminds me of Jungle Kiana with her gut wrench spinning power yeah. bomb. Yeah, sometimes she would stop more before she threw down, and sometimes there was that less in between period. Sure. Um, mm. This is just a different conversation now. Uh, I anyways, to, I had to find a way to bring Jungle Kiana into this conversation. It's been too long. Yeah, it's fair. It's fair. Mm. We already did our series on her, so stop. Um, you know I won't stop. I know, I know. So let's go to why is it coming match? here in the first place? Because of the first match. Who did she have it against? Jungle Kiana. There we go. Yeah, and how many times did Jungle Kiana win this title? So the next match in the series was <laughs> so, an interesting one because, so, like, so, I don't so, think so, anyone so, expected this either. That's true. No one expected this match to be great. Or as great as it was. Some hmm. people, you know, maybe had high expectations for it, especially after the side match. Yeah. Um, but this is an important time now. Utami is not main eventing this pay-per-view. This was Yokohama Dream Cinderella in spring on April 4th, 2021. And Julia was once again main eventing in a tag title match, teaming up with Shuri, forming ALK. Hey, she'd just gone through her recovery yeah. period, her redemption yeah. tour of one yeah. match. Yep. And she'd be facing Mahime, and we know how that went. Uh, sorry to really push it on Trent here, this stuff. Uh, <laughs> but Utami started to verbally say that she was kind of annoyed of not being in the main event. Mm. Uh, she said in an interview she wanted to be in the main event. She is the yeah. world champion. Why is she not in the main event? And this match was the last time she wasn't in the main event. And they absolutely killed it to make sure that it would never happen again. Um, and that was, of course, against one B Priestley. I and you know, if you're a stardom fan, you know how people feel about B. Not she is not beloved by everybody. She had her moments from time to time. Yeah. Mm. You know, one of, one of the better, you know, foreign wrestlers in their history. I would form a world of stardom champion. So, yeah. you know, big deal here. Um, She's in the yeah. shortlist. Absolutely. 
And I also remember notably, there was a lot of fear that maybe she'd win the title back from some people. I never had that fear, but I remember going to this match and be like, oh, I don't have high expectations for this match. You know, it's like B hadn't looked great necessarily since she had come back. Um, she, she's you know, she was mostly a tag image. team wrestler. Yeah, yeah, she she'd really come into her own just pre-pandemic. She had the title match mm-hmm. against Tana Kimura, which no one expected to be as good as it was. And she started to hit her groove as a villainous character working with Jamie Hayter. And then the pandemic hit, she lost her she tag had the title. title match too. Yeah, yeah. And she, she lost the tag titles. She lost her running mate, coming back into a difficult situation. And fair play to her. She didn't have to come back to stardom yeah. during this time. But she you know, she flew over and worked her ass off. Uh, yeah, she wasn't necessarily hitting to the heights that she was in the pre-pandemic. But I do think people have painted B Priestley with a certain paintbrush that becomes disrespectful to how good she ended up being in stardom. Yes, the first couple of tours weren't fantastic. Yes, she wasn't maybe the world championship level when a lot of others were knocking on that door when she won the title. But I do think she gets hard done by, especially in retrospect, when she's putting matches out like this. And look, Utami is still at the point where she can help lead the match, but like if she has a fantastic match, it's not because she carried a broomstick. She needs mm-hmm. the right person to be bouncing off here. And B Priestley does just as much as this match to make it good as Utami does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, this match is like I, I rewatched this pretty close to recording time, and I was just like, I remember being wowed. I remember being impressed because I loud in the I, crowd. Well. That goes without saying. Uh, but this match was great. This match was yeah. truly great. Um, B put everything into it, and of course we learned why mm. um, at the end. This would be B's last match in stardom as she'd leave for WWE. Um, which she somehow is still in. Um, still in NXT, by the way. Whatever. Anyways, uh, she's never going to probably have this great of a match again. Uh, but this is this felt like the ultimate statement for Utami to be like, okay, put me in that goddamn main event. I'm done. You know, like we're gonna put on a show here. We're gonna steal the show. Um, you know, B hits two nasty stomps to the outside, mm. one from the top rope, run one from the apron to onto Utami with a table over Utami, which was nasty. Uh, you got the air raid on the apron that I was talking about a little bit earlier. That was absolutely nasty. B did not have a good landing <laughs> at all. What do you think happened there? Because it looks like she was goes she trying to, to grab the brace rope? herself with the arm. Yeah, because everyone she got else caught kind on of, the rope. Yeah, everyone else just kind of takes it on their back and just kind of goes. This moves kind of suck, but it almost feels like she tried to protect herself a little bit more or maybe she wasn't fully secure in how she was being held but the end result is like i'm surprised she didn't like dislocate her elbow or something because it is the the arm does not bend the way it's meant to and then she still takes the rough landing but Mm -hmm. yeah that that wasn't fun to watch or probably more so to take it was it was brutal and another move that didn't look all too fun to take was the top rope snap German suplex when Tommy was going up and B just ripped her off. That was yeah. picture perfect. Um, my one of my favorite moments of this match is when uh Utami hits the cutter and it's obviously a callback to Osprey, but they scream RKO, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, she didn't do the springboard, you gotta do no, the no, to but cut. like. The reason we did the cutter was the ass cutter, but it, yeah, she's I not get busting it. it out to yeah, you know, then set up for a punt kick. Right, right. I went crazy. Um, but that was a great. Well, that's let's be honest, great. Her, her true favorite was Diamond Dallas Page. It was a Diamond Cutter. Mm, there you go. Um, you know, B had, had a lot of neat strikes throughout the match. Um, you know, because she kind of liked to take from a lot of wrestlers during that time. Um, so I remember take- watching like this time period with someone who came in through New Japan. And (laughs) I distinctly remember her saying to me, boy, these women take a lot of moves from New Japan. 
and the knees and like the the Kamigoya and stuff. It was it was like B Priestley and Arisa Hashiki mainly that kind of triggered it for them. Uh, but it was yeah, just fast, yeah. Like you, I was watching this match. Going, oh yeah, I, I know exactly the time period where. Well, in. we knew because the Kamigoya so became really popular around this time, not just yeah. with B obviously, but a lot of people started to go. That's a cool move that I'm going to do worse than Kadobushi. <sighs> yeah. Um, speaking of doing moves worse than. The original owner, uh, B would hit the ocean cyclone suplex. The most I'm not controversial it, move in Joshi. I, I was gonna say, I'm not calling it the clean's landing, so don't you dare. <laughs> what a Game of uh, Thrones reference. Well, she was part of Queen's Quest, I know, but like it, it is a Game of Thrones Game of reference. Thrones. Qu- yeah. Queen's Queen's Landing, King's Land, I don't know, whatever. You, you, it, it, I remember the landing part in Game of Thrones, yes. Yeah. Uh, but then we get the kick out, the big kick out, mm-hmm. obviously, and Nami Toyo rolled her eyes as she washed on. Um, Akira, she rolled Akira, in her non-existent grave. Akira Hokuto was actually ringside, by the way. Uh, she was happy. She, the, she was happy. Oh, no, actually, B took the rose that Utami had given her, and she was very happy about that, and B ruined it, and I was upset watching that. I was like, oh, what a heel. How dare you do that to Akira Hokuto? You better hope she doesn't get up. Um, Nothing beats the house show when Taurus took it from a random fan, and the fan uh, chases her down the entrance while wanting it back. That's an all-timer. Yeah. Um, so she kicks out. Uh, you know, B hits a B driver at one point, which was a great callback, obviously. Um, but ultimately, Utami, Looking at Momo, she does it too. Yes. Yes, and ultimately Utami's able to overcome this and successfully defend the title, BT bomb. Uh, but my God, like this is this is one of those matches that's like, oh, Utami is. I just remember walking away from this match, like, okay, Utami's undeniable now. Like everyone, just shut up. All right, like we are here. If you get the, that uh, match, it'd be Priestley. Pretty much, pretty much. Like the side, you know, you. I wasn't doing podcasts at the time or anything. I just remember this match being great. And it was, I think I just had maybe started one of my show like right after this, but it was so good. You had to talk about the B Priestley match so much. No, you started a podcast. no, shush, shush. Uh, but again, just fantastic match, like top tier, best match of B's career, I think. Like, from my just watching this back, I was like, she was mm. she hit everything correctly, it was just on. Point Utami was so good as the champion that just kept coming back and coming back. And this is the match I think that really established Utami as like this unbeatable force because B hit her with everything. It's a combination of a few things because obviously, like this match, B hits her with everything. Yeah. And also, like Momo hitting the Peach Sunrise and yes. Utami kicking out of that. Uh, Utami kicking out of some of Mayu's big moves. Like, it was a case of, I. You go back to everyone's favorite website, Cage Match, and look at the reviews for the matches around the time that they happen. And there is a certain subset of people going, lol, Utami wins, super Utami kicking out of everything. It is interesting looking at now, but like Mm -hmm. it is, you definitely see there is a poignant effort to have her look like someone who can endure everything. And this match in particular, like she takes a beating. Like, yeah. yes, she got beat up by Momo and she got beat up by Mayu. But B kind of, there's, it's a very raw style to her. It's like the knee heavy offense and stuff like that. Yeah, it feels like Utami's just going, you know, getting haggard, trying to survive the offense towards the end. They do a good job of sort of proving, like, yes, Utami's a power wrestler, but she can also fight from underneath when she needs to, which will be quite poignant for the next match. Um, but this was so important, as you kind of mentioned. Like she was now in the semi-main event for two matches in a row. The first match, I think people were able to justify hair versus hair, the end of a big rivalry. It was a lot harder to justify, even though obviously ALK versus my Hime for the tag titles was a big match. It didn't carry that same gravitas as the month prior. And even maybe someone like B Priestley kind of felt like, oh, why, why is she not getting the main event here? Yeah. Now, I don't know how much of that is because of the post-match angle that we get with B announcing retiring. she's retiring. It's it's all, it's well, kind of a... This leaving stardom. Frozen. She didn't retire. I need to preface that. I keep saying retiring as well. She technically did not retire, but she did leave. She retired retire. from professional wrestling. She yeah. went to join sports entertainment. I also remember like this, this night's very, like... 
locked in my mind because they have this great match no one expected. Then B le- says she's leaving stardom. And then immediately after that, Osprey beats Kota Bushi for the IWGP yeah. world title. And I just remember like everyone just being like, what in the world is going on here? Um, but yeah, uh, it, it's a very important match um, in her run because like as we've said, it establishes her as this unbeatable champion. But like you said, you call back to all the other title matches and how they built that up for her to make the next match all the more special. And it was in the main event. She and it was in back. the main event. And uh Tommy returns to the main event where they kind of like technically there's stuff after this match. Sure, kind of takes focus, but it is, for all intents and purposes, the last match on the card. That was Tokyo Dream Cinderella on June 12th, 2021. You may have heard of it. It was Utami defending the title against Sherry for 43 minutes and 19 seconds. The highest rated women's match in. 30 years per Dave Meltzer, it just, it it broke everything open. It was a legitimate game-changing match for stardom. Yes. Not just these two wrestlers, but stardom. It brought stardom from that really good women's promotion in Japan that people know, you know, Io Shirai from and Kairi from to one of the top promotions in the world on a more you know more recognized by the Mm. world Mm. obviously we knew but not everyone knew and after this match no one could deny you had people from like sports illustrated talking about justin barrasso i remember saying everyone needs to see this match now it's just saying everyone needs to see this match but if you watch this match live you just felt something special happening like when this match was over I just remember sitting, like, I don't know how many times I've watched a match live and felt this way. This is, like, one of those experiences where you just remember everything that happened, right? You remember mm-hmm. everything that happened. You remember the the what happened after it. Like, not after the match itself, but what came from the show. It's just incredible, man. <laughs> it's just so It's just so incredible what they accomplished here. I still remember like watching this match and kind of uh, you, you were saying after it finished the second time because technically it finishes and yes. then they do oh yeah five more minutes yeah um, after the the match I was just sort of sitting there and like not really paying attention to anything I just had to soak in that experience mm-hmm. and it's akin to me when I go to the cinema and I see a, like what I classify as a five star movie yeah, yeah when I went to see Parasite in cinemas. The credits start rolling, and normally, like I'm, I get up. I don't care about the credits. Yeah, mm-hmm. I get up and leave. I got to go to the toilet. But like for a five star movie, I'm just kind of sitting there. And the credits are rolling. I'm just kind of in a haze, just going, "Whoa, what did I just mm-hmm. watch?" Yeah. And that was me during this match. And even with matches, I, because I, I don't like rating matches. I just like complaining about Meltzer's ratings. But like other matches that would kind of fall in my quote unquote five star area. Yeah. Even some of those, I don't have that same kind of like, whoa, what did I just see? Yeah. This like is the I most this match. I've seen a lot of great matches in my time. Okay. We all have. Mm. Mm. This is maybe the only match that, like, I think before it was over, I didn't even know what the finish was. I had no idea where this was going. I was just like, this is perfect. It's amazing. It's yeah. one of the best things I've ever watched. This is, and, and I just want to share some comments. We can go through the match first, but I want to share comments from others about it because mm-hmm. I wrote an article about this back for Voices Wrestling. I called it the catapult into superstardom for the brand itself. And just from reading back some of these things, it's great because it's from people that I didn't know watched, you know? Mm. And that, that when, when you're, when you can have a match that breaks through that that glass of, you know, the Joshi bubble, the Joshi bubble, but even the J- Japanese bubble, 
because there was still that's still a pretty like and it's not it doesn't really exist as much anymore. It's still there, but, but it's not still the there. It was in right before this match. Like, like, like this is a game changing match. It's still there, pretty much for everything that isn't New Japan and now Stardom in many ways. Mm. Like if you're not Bushiroad affiliated, it's still there, essentially. Yeah. Now, back then, it was pretty much maybe just New Japan. At time, because this was Okada, you know, this was right off the Okada Omega mm-hmm. era and whatnot. Um, so people were paying attention. I just said Osprey won a title, and you know, so people were paying attention to that. And this shattered any of that, and people paid attention. So let's go through the match. Uh, 43 minutes, instant classic. Um, does not feel like 43 minutes. That's maybe it, its biggest, like, bravo to the match to not feel like 43 minutes. I have watched matches that go 30 minutes. I've watched matches that go 20 minutes, and this match feels shorter than both. The Mike, Kirk, and Hall match felt longer. Far longer. Um, okay, let's do my best to go through this match. There's a lot that happens in this match, obviously. Um, you know, I always, I always think of the uh, absolute spills that Shuri takes in this match. Because Shuri, and, and notably, these two, destroy each other in mm. this match like that's a very important reason of why this was so great um i i'm sorry i'm drawing a blank because i am trying to i'm reading what i had wrote because i had wrote a match of like um a match like summary of sorts and i'm like mm. this is just this is just way too much there's just so much that went on um uh, i will let you take the lead here I'll let you take the lead here because I'm getting something together for post. So, right, this right, is... yeah, throw me into the fire. Look, I'm not, I'm not going to do a move by move breakdown. Kind no, of no, you I'm, can't. No. It's 43 yeah. minutes. <laughs> I, I think the important thing is like this match doesn't let up. Now mm-hmm. there are moments when they stop and they sell and they breathe, but the match intensity doesn't let up. It, and it's something even they struggled to recapture in their follow up matches was that growing tension. Like, yes, you're aware vaguely that there's a time limit, but Stardom never really threatened the championship time limit bubble before this match. Because Stardom matches typically, like, around this time they were starting to creep in length. You know, like we see it in these matches, like the Micah match went for 25 minutes, the Maya match went for 25 minutes, the Momo match I think went for 22, 23. So, and people were calling it the New Japanification of the Stardom main event scene. But this match just has that unique vibe to keep the tension going. And you're, you're aware the time limit's coming, but because it hadn't really been done before in Stardom, you kind of brush it off. It's like, oh, yeah, it's just background music. And then it's getting closer and closer. It's like, oh, hang on. Like, are they actually going? They're going to go to a draw, I think, just the way it's built up. Mm-hmm. And then they go straight back into it after the draw. It's so ferocious. And what I love about it, particularly how it's done in this match, like occasionally you'll see Tami lose like her armband or something while she's fighting, but it feels like as the match is going off, she's just almost trying to pull off parts of her costume just to find, like, yeah. uh, you know, free up the forearm for a hit. And like, she looks like she's gone through an absolute war because she's not wearing her yeah. full full armbands and the wristbands are gone. Mm-hmm. She's just red. She's exhausted. She's just done, yeah. and it speaks to how good they're able to go. That one second. I I want I do want to say like when this match gets going because like a lot of the early going is Shuri's domination and mm-hmm. Shuri kind of almost outclassing because rem- you have to remember going into this match Shuri is still in that league of her own like no one beats her right and this yeah. is pretty much her entire reign obviously mm-hmm. <laughs> but she she was just like this different being that made everyone look lesser than her yeah and so much of this match, you know, she's just bringing it to Tommy. And like you said, she looked like she had gone through a war. Yeah. And it wasn't until, you know, she went for that diving soccer kick and absolutely ate it. Tailbone first, by the way. At one of the nastiest spills I've ever seen where someone just got up and kept going for another 20 plus. And, and, and I also remember one of my favorite parts of this match is Julia's on commentary. Mm -hmm. so she is reacting to everything that is happening to shuri along the way you know there was an air there was an air raid crash 
again, but this time you know you have you have Julia screaming, mm. screaming, but they play it up. You know, she hits that move. It's like a move. It's 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 not a leap of faith, but it is. It is Utami. Like okay, I I, I got back into this, but we are now like fifty fifty, mm. and you know it's just insane insane what these two are able to achieve before 30 minutes even gets there yeah. um you know they they attempted they were doing old they were just slapping each other across the face you got another air raid crash in the middle of the ring where sure he kicked out a two the pace just kept going and going Sure, he hit a flying knee that rocked to Tommy, and then that final bell happened. And I remember being devastated. I was like, oh, we just and I remember sitting there. I was like, you know what? That was a tremendous title match. I'm yeah. okay with the draw. That's yeah. fine. You know, it was it was a great, great, great. It still had like match of the year consideration. Easily well done. You made it to 30 minutes. Like, yep. The women's matches don't do that. Good job. Go and get go and have a shower. And then they kept going. They would get back up. And the last 13 minutes was an all-out fight to the finish. Mm. All-out fight to the finish. They hit each other with everything. And I just I just remember watching this, right? Because it's like, who's gonna win? Now that now that they're continuing, you just expect a winner. Yeah. Because this yeah. is so unique. You don't, you don't, and it you can't. You know, I hate like in wrestling when like they do the 60 minute Iron Man match and then like we're going extra time. It's like shut up. Like who cares? But when you go to a time limit drop, 30 minutes, and you keep going, you just like and you could feel the crowd getting excited. They're like, mm -hmm. oh, here we go. It had the big fight feel for a second time, right? Like that you get in preparation for a match, and and they just were trading back and forth. You get um you, you get an insane power uh you got i'm sorry there's just so much that happened but you got utami dropped on her head for an incredible near fall um she would reverse kick and then hit a massive power bomb she'd get to her feet again and hit her bt bomb finish and this was what put all opponents away but no shuri grabbed onto that rope because it was a spinner Yep. If she'd stopped, if she'd done the lift up and the straight down, mm -hmm. she would have this, this match just like we wouldn't have had the rivalry. She grabbed the rope. These two would have the final exchange, pulling out everything in their arsenals. A devastating Larry by Utami was met by one kick by Shuri. Both felt to the mat. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. She nine, thought she's ten. counting quick. He wanted it to end. Yeah, it's all right. I want to end. Uh, <laughs> it's a double knockout. The match is over. Unbelievable. Unbelievable match. Yep. It is, it is like, it's actually become my go-to, what's your favorite match now? Because it's like, it's the bliss of watching that live, right? Mm -hmm. It's like I watched that live. I experienced that live. I'll never get that experience again because even if I watch that match back, I'll never get that experience. It's just something about that 43 minutes. Like you said at the beginning of this, it was one of those matches where you just, I, what did I just watch? Right. Yeah. It's like sitting we in a movie. We're lucky enough to go in without the expectation of everyone talking it up. Like, oh yeah, yeah. people coming into this match like you do have the oh this is the greatest women's match of all time some people are saying so it does set a certain expectation which can make it difficult to watch with the same kind of if we're being honest ignorant bliss that we had watching mm. this live we knew it was going to be good sure he's great Tommy's right. great she finally gets a main event match again but like we weren't expecting 43 minutes five and a half stars no no one no one, like Again, this is one of those matches. You're in the Joshi bubble. You're a Joshi fan. You're a Stardom fan. You watch this and you're like, "Oh, this is one of the greatest matches. This is one of the match of the year. Like, this is the match everyone should watch." But you don't really expect it. Yeah. And then you know, five and a half stars later, 
And, you know, I, I, I remember this. I remember this vividly. Uh, Tom Lawler said, mm. watch the match if you value your time, <laughs> which I thought was a great line. Um, you know, Dave had called it one of the best matches all year. Mark Ramondi of ESPN stated that not only was it one of the best matches he had seen all year, but it was in, I quote, an absolute classic. Um, Voice of the Wrestling was all over it um they had a great tweet like hey hey you go watch the tiger show you right now it's phenomenal um it was it was stardom's okada versus omega Mm, mm, mm. that's the only comparison i can make to it yeah it was incredible important impact for the company in the greatest sense because stardom had been growing and more people were starting to pay attention but this opened the floodgates because Previously, if you were getting into stardom, you had to consciously want to watch Japanese women's wrestling, mm-hmm. which not everyone's going to go out of the way to do. Even mm-hmm. if, like, if you're watching WWE, you see Asuka and go, oh, what's Asuka about? What's other Japanese women's wrestling? It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go out of your way to watch a Japanese program that doesn't necessarily have great English support and watch two women you've never heard of. You mm-hmm. needed this kind of uh, watershed moment where you had the – for better or worse, the voices of the industry in a Dave Meltzer saying, no, go watch this match. Like, listen to me, seriously, go watch this match. Yeah. And it speaks to how important those five-star ratings are from Dave when it's outside the usual bubble. That's why Just we get at, angry uh, when it doesn't get five. Yeah, look, that, that's why we get particularly fiery with a lot of his four and three quarters in recent times with Star because people hear five from Dave from a promotion they're not aware of. They don't have the AEW bias or the WWE bias or the New Japan bias. When he gives five stars to Stardom or an independent match or a CMLL match like he did, people go, oh, I should at least go see what this match is about so I can complain yeah. on Twitter that it wasn't worth five stars. And that alone gets people watching and paying attention and yeah. investing more. And like you just had to see for people who were watching stardom as it was happening. Some of you people watching this, listening to this may not have been doing so. Yeah. There was a serious uptick in like, what's this stardom promotion all about? And not just like, mm-hmm. oh, you tell me and Shuri are great, but like, who else is there? Oh my, I've heard about right. her. Yeah. Julia. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It, it, it did so much for stardom as a whole power of a single match mm-hmm. it only takes one match and ultimately that one match came in the reign of utami Hayashishta. that's where gateway our... Joshi drug. yeah and that's where our first part comes to an end it's why it's why utami is so important to joshi wrestling today and we sit here and she's only 25 years old and she has this entire reign behind her and mm. It feels like she almost had an entire career behind her as she steps into this new chapter, obviously, for her own career. Uh, but I'm very excited to, you know, do part two of this because there's a real different feeling now yes. for every single title match she has because it's like the pressure's on to try to live up to something that is all-time great, right? Like... No one was touching this. No. It was impossible. And it's not her fault. She she is a better wrestler now <laughs> than she was back then. It's just it's just how it goes sometimes. Sometimes Matt, sometimes everything clicks. And as we saw for much of this Utami reign, everything clicked. Yeah. It's uh, a reign of two halves, and it is literally pinpointed by this match, which is because yeah. we were talking about it like, huh, do we, where do we put this match? Is it on episode one or is it episode two? Because episode two, like, there's less matches in that half, and one of the matches is basically no go. Like, do we push the Shuri match to the second half of this sort of recap? But it is such a watershed moment, so important to the reign that it's, you know, to put it into historical terms it's kind of like bc and ad in the world timeline it's like before and after the shuri match the first half of uh, utami's reign is all about proving herself worthy you know she has to go up against the veterans and prove herself able to survive them she has to prove that she can handle leading a match she has to prove that you know she deserves that main event spot everything clicks for the shuri match and then the second half of the reign that we'll be covering next episode is all about like oh, okay can you, what have you done for me lately? Can you do it again? 
yeah, the pressure of that kind of match is now weighing on her shoulders as she has to go forward and put forth a, as strong a reign as she can, all while people are going, can we get the Shuri match again? Let's get Utami Shuri too. Where is it? Yeah, it's a difficult... You know, for as great as that match was, it put a whole new world of pressure onto Utami. And next episode, we're going to look at how she handles that, which is just as interesting as how she proves herself worthy in the first place. Mm-hmm. She she is someone who could take um she could take the challenges right and she took a lot of challenges mm. she's someone that was again pushed into a big spot from day one and yep. this is the biggest spot that i think any stardom wrestler at the time had faced and that is being the f- not only following up a all-time special match but keeping interest in the product and obviously you know stardom has more interest than ever so you know what she did a pretty good job mm. uh spoiler but we'll we'll get to that we'll talk about the legacy of her reign kind of her legacy and stardom as a whole at that point mm. and uh it'll be a lot of fun but uh before that trent you got any plugs and we'll be back next week notably we will be back yes. in one week we will get back to our regular schedule so we're giving you back-to-back weeks for the first time in stardom road um we just missed a week because it was old busy 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 week i pushed it back and we're gonna give it was wrestlemania that. weekend like even though we're primarily stardom a lot of wrestling out there yeah, and it was the japanese so. grand prix like I just, yes yeah yeah we we had a lot a lot we had a loss for one we had to watch a lot mm. of matches yes and, and we, we have to watch to a lot of prom. matches for these episodes in hindsight, maybe not the best move doing the championship reign during the busiest period in wrestling, but it no. was too important to do it now. Timing's everything as well. Yes. Yeah. But uh, yeah, back to back, we'll be here next week, and then we're like, the schedule hasn't changed. We just no. moved one week up to. Well, the yeah, schedule changed back. for a week, not overall. Yeah. But yeah. moving forward. And of course, yeah. this is an evergreen kind of show. So if you're listening to this in you know, 3033, it, just click on the next episode. Yeah, you're welcome, everybody. Um, Trent, plugs? A bathroom or kitchen plug? <sighs> you can find me on Twitter, at One Up Culture. Uh, I recently, uh, I can't, I'm horrible with timing. A couple of weeks ago, uh, we recently launched uh, Rizura, which is our new old Joshi uh, website, which is being head up by the fantastic Ryan Dilbert. I have an article on there, which is all about the rivalry between Julian and Tam Nakano. It felt fitting to cover it now because just like covering new Tommy Total Reign right now, Julia's leaving stardom. So that reign is that, that rivalry is kind of being put on, on the ice for a bit. So I, I do my usual deep dive on that. Uh, I have a new episode of Chocolate Cast coming out later this week. A um, lot happening in the world of Gato Moves. So be sure to check that out too if you're interested in it. And for everything else at One Up Culture, don't think I'm moving anywhere. Follow me at Scott Eat Wrestling on Twitter. I'll be, if you want to check out all the content that I'm sure to have this week, a lot of uh, new stuff for Rossi Ogawa's promotion. I had breaking news audio over on the fight game media network youtube channel as well as the normal five-star judge show upload um on the podcast feed you can find that anywhere type in uh fight game media network or uh five-star judge show you should be able to find it on any podcast platform um and i think that's it for now so we'll be back next week with utami hayashi shishita's World of Stardom Title Reign Part 2. But until then, this was the Stardom Road Podcast right here on the Count Out Podcast Network. We'll see you next time. See ya.